Welcome to the second part of our series on perspectives on the war in or Ukraine. Last week, we heard about economic impacts of the Russian invasion and the continued assault of Russian forces on Ukraine by air and land forces. Two weeks from now, we will hear a broader historical view of the European land empires that have been the ambition of Germany and Russia. Today's presentation concerns the connection of this war with the crisis of democracy in Eastern Europe. Our speaker is M. Stephen Fish, professor of political science. After a BA in history and government from Cornell and an MA in international relations from Johns Hopkins, Professor Fish earned his PhD in political science at Stanford in 93. After two years teaching at uh, UPenn, he came to uh, Berkeley in 1995 and rose to full professor in 2006. He has held visiting appointments or fellowships in China, Indonesia, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Poland. His research interests include political regimes and regime change, revolutions, social movements, political parties, constitutional systems and national legislatures, and the politics and ideology sociology of religion. In addition to the dozens of articles related to these topics, he is the author of three books and three co-authored books, among which I will mention Are Muslims Distinctive? A Look at, at the Evidence in 2011, which was among the top 25 books among choices of uh, outstanding academic titles for, in 2012, and Democracy Derailed in Russia, The Failure of Open Politics in 2005, honored by the Best Book Award of, <clears throat> of uh, in 2006 by the Comparative Demo Democratization Section of the American Political so so Science Association. His next book is forthcoming on April 15th and has the timely title, The Comeback, Crushing Trump, Claiming the Nation, and Restoring Democracy's Dominance. Professor Fish is also a recipient of the College of Letters and Science Distinguished Teaching Award in 2005. He has commentated on cable news networks around the world and published op-eds in Foreign Policy, Los Angeles Times, Newsday, The Washington Post, the San Jose Mercury News, and papers in Indonesia, Turkey, and India. I'm delighted to welcome him now to speak to us on Russia's war on Ukraine and the crisis of democracy in Eastern Europe. Go ahead. Thanks so much, Donald, and thank you guys for inviting me to speak. It's always a pleasure to uh, to speak with fellow faculty members, and um, and it's it's you know I'm I'm delighted to be able to join you today. So, what I'd like to do is talk, of course, as Donald mentioned, and as you know about the uh, about the war in Ukraine, and to look at the international dimension of it. And, you know, I think we can start off with, let's start off with the big picture. In fact, I'll, for the most part, just focus on the big picture today. But Putin invaded Ukraine uh, under a cloud of delusion. He really did believe that Ukrainians were going to rise up and welcome him. Otherwise, how could an army of 180,000 men or so take over a country of 44 million people and just occupy it and annex it. In order to believe that that was possible, Putin had to believe that most Ukrainians, or at least a very large portion of them, would rise up and support him. We know that some of the tank drivers that, I don't know if you remember the early days of the war when that big column of tanks was headed into Kiev and it stalled and the tanks didn't have the supply trucks they needed. They were running out of gas. The tires were peeling off because they were so poorly made. Apparently, the generals had been buying the cheap stuff and pocketing the difference between the cheap material for the tanks and the expensive stuff that the defense ministry paid for. Um, and as you recall, at that time, uh, with that big line of tanks going in, uh, we heard reports that some of the tank drivers had their they're like dress uniforms, the ones they use in formal ceremonies in the back of their tanks because they were planning a week or two after they got there to be marching at a victory parade in Kiev. So really, I mean, this, this invasion was, was done under a profound state of delusion on Putin's part, thought Ukrainians would rise up. He also thought that the West was too effete. It was too soft. It was too selfish to actually unite behind Ukraine and you know offer this country in which the West has some interest but not perhaps you know overwhelming interest the support it would need to stand up to Russia. Now this product this decision in part was a product of Putin's isolation. Putin is generally speaking been regarded as a wily, kind of reasonable, in some sense, character. He's always been wicked. He's always been sociopathic. But he also has been uh, smart. He's been reasonable. 
and he has been reasonable in the sense that he that he is he is amenable to reason. He is not he's not one of these dictators that's kind of like off in la la, la land because he's been in power so too long. That started to change in recent years, though, and some people think it was especially with COVID. Uh, Putin is so COVID scared that he would not meet with anybody um, during COVID. And the people, in fact, who met with Putin had to go through, you can imagine you know, the scientific veracity of this, these like decontamination tunnels that led back to his one of, you know, to all his different mansions and palaces all over the country. Um, and so he became really very isolated. And as he did so, he hunkered down in these, these big basement bunkers of his palaces with these huge maps of, you know, quote unquote, historic Russia. He's a big fan of, of military history. And of course, the version he read of it basically, you know, considered everything from Portugal to Alaska to be Russia historically. And he, he you know, believed that. And decided that it was that you know it was his great kind of heroic combat task as Russian ruler to win back all that territory and reassemble Russia as it rightfully is, which is this huge empire. Uh, Portugal, I, I said Portugal to Alaska. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's certainly Poland to Alaska. Um, his idea of historic Russia is Russia in 1914, which was much broader than the Soviet Union. It actually included Krakow and Warsaw um other other major parts of eastern europe as well i think he also thinks that russia has a rightful uh state to alaska um as you know it was purchased uh, by abraham lincoln secretary abraham lincoln back in and in his successors uh back in the 1860s and 70s it became part of the united states uh, i think putin thinks it's legitimately part of russia as well he has a very expansive notion of russia and he decided that he was going to go for it his career-long ambition has been to expand russia's territories at least to where they were at the end of the soviet union and what's more to you know, establish kind of the Russian idea, you know, is this you know, very prominent idea in the world, Russian ways of doing things, Russian ways of thinking about international relations. And along with these goals has gone, has, is, has been his goal of making Russia fully sovereign. Putin has this interesting idea about sovereignty. He thinks that sovereignty is the most important thing in the world for a country, and that there are only like half a dozen or eight sovereign countries in the world, that is countries that don't depend on anybody else um, in the international system. So he sees Germany as an economic powerhouse, but he doesn't think it's a real country because it's not sovereign, right? It's dependent on the United States. He really thinks there's only a handful of sovereign countries in the world and that he wants Russia to be fully part of that club. So these are the kind of imperial expansionist in some sense, delusional notions that Putin went into this invasion with. Let me get back to a point I just made a little bit earlier, which is that in order for this to work, put, you know, the West would have to not respond forcefully. And Putin was banking on that. He thought the West would talk a good game, but when it came to making any sacrifices at all, economic, military, uh, security, that the West would actually, they, they talk a good game, but we would not rise up and really support Ukraine with tens of billions of dollars of support. We wouldn't be willing to endure the counter sanctions that went along with levying strong sanctions on Russia. He sees the West as kind of materialistic and effete. And uh, this kind of delusion is very common among fascists and uh, fascist dictators. If you look through history, Hitler thought the same thing, right? That these surrounding territories were effete and weak. They were no longer martial people. Um, they were in some sense racially polluted by their ethnic minorities. Putin doesn't buy that racial story, but nevertheless, he has this notion of a kind of effete worn out West. His notion of America's strength was uh, influenced very deeply by Donald Trump's election, which Putin himself, as we know, helped secure. Whether Putin's in, um, intervention in that election, you'll remember that well, was decisive or not, we can never know for sure. But um, by far the, the, the best scholarly work on it, the work by Kathleen Hall Jamison, who's kind of the dean of, of a communi political communication studies in the United States, uh, she's at Penn, 
Um, she started off skeptical that the intervention was all that influential. By the time she got done with her book, which is the best thing on the topic, she decided it probably tipped the election. Putin was riding very high after that. And the fact that Trump was elected by the unit by Americans really kind of did in his respect for the United States. Um, Trump thinks that Putin loves him and respects him because Trump is so stupid. Putin actually feels the same way about Trump that Angela Merkel and all these other people do. Is absolutely no respect for him, as you can imagine. But Trump thinks that Putin likes him, right, because he said some nice things about him. But after Trump was elected, with his own help, with Putin's help, Putin really started feeling like the master of the world. Um, he had, at least since about 2012, when he returned for his for his uh, third term as president, had been kind of the, the battering ram and kind of the, the tip of the sword of the global autocratic movement. He was the great prince of darkness who was kind of leading the anti-democratic movement in the world. The fact that, that he could have possibly tipped the election to Trump and just the fact that the Americans would elect Trump, or, I mean, which no one in the world could possibly have imagined what happened before it did, convinced him that the West, in fact, in the United States, which is a country that really matters as far as he's concerned, in the West, was you know pretty much in decline, over the hill, manipulable, um, lacking in you know, lacking in uh, in willingness to sacrifice for anything. Well, Putin learned a lesson because when he tangled with Joe Biden, he got a very different response than he would have from Donald Trump, who of course would have folded and and who was actually shilled for Putin's second invasion now of Ukraine since February two thousand twenty two. Biden united the entire democratic world, or almost all of it, against Putin, uh, put together a coalition of countries that was willing to sacrifice, a coalition of countries that was actually willing to, um, you know, to pay an economic price, that was willing to donate large portions of their, of their military stocks to defend Ukraine. This shocked Putin. And, and of course, in some sense, it actually really created a you know, uh, a feeling among countries, not just in the West, but it's really the whole democratic world, including Korea and Japan and South Korea and Japan and some other countries as well, that in fact, democracies were, were still hanging in there, right? That we could still unite, that we still valued our principles and so on. Um, what's happened in, let's look at Europe for a second, just that portion of the, of the democratic world, a very central one, obviously, including in this conflict. Um, what we see happening in Europe since this attack is, and really it was happening, you know, to some extent before the attack, but the, but Putin's attack on Ukraine has really raised the kind of international profile of a, of a phenomenon that's really, I think, really fascinating and probably doesn't get as much attention in the United States as it might, which is the rise of a new generation of European leaders who are, who are Democrats, right? Small D Democrats, and who are kind of leading the charge against ethno-national demagoguery, Trumpian demagoguery in Europe. Of course, we know that all, almost all European countries have their Trumps. This is a new generation of leaders. Some of them are classical cons liberals, that is their right center, kind of John McCain types, uh, Margaret Thatcher types perhaps, people who are right of center perhaps on economic policy and other issues, but that are nevertheless died in the wool Democrats. There's no doubt that they would you know, leave, leave power, if they, leave office if they lost an election and so on. Um, so you have these kind of right center Democrats, people, and then people on the left center, and then all the way over to Greens. And there's a kind of comedy of, of interest and, and, um, and ideology among them that's basic core feature is, is fealty to liberalism in its classical sense, liberalism, right? Meaning rights and the rule of law and all the things that are needed to, to have a modern democracy. Um, <laughs> and among those leaders, we see a very large number of young women. So if you look at that, at the countries that form the kind of, you know, western edge of, the, of Russia's, you know, Russia's western border, going from Finland all the way down to Moldova, most of these countries in, the, in recent years have been led by women who are under 50 years old. So you start with Sana Marin up in Finland who was voted out as prime minister. She was very popular, but 
but her party lost elections last year. The 34-year-old prime minister, this glamorous young woman who was, who was really a fabulous prime minister of Finland, very popular. And she, she became a kind of go-to person in, you know, for kind of tough statements and actions when it came to standing up to Putin. Then we have the, uh, have the uh, prime minister of Estonia, Kaya Kallas, another under 50 year old woman um, who became who's still in office and is now known as kind of the, the young iron lady in Europe for her very strong stance against Putin. She wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times about the time of the invasion, where she basically, Putin's invasion in February of 2022, where she just laid it out. She said, look, here's the deal. Here's what the Russians are up to. We Estonians know, <laughs> know all too well what's going on here with Russian power. And here's what we need to do. We need to unite our entire region. We need to give a substantial chunk of our GNP to this war effort. And, you know, some people at the time thought, oh, that's a little over the top. Well, over the months, her, her, her op-ed, in a sense, became Western policies. It became clear that she was absolutely right about everything that she'd said. The, uh, the prime minister of, of uh, Denmark, the foreign minister of Germany, Annalena Baerbach, um, all the way down to the, the president of Moldova, Maria Sandu. This is this kind. This has become this kind of arc of pro-democratic feminine steel around Putin's Russian Western edge that has kind of risen during this conflict. Some of them were already in power and, and were, were known uh, in Europe before the conflict, but they've really kind of emerged uh, during this conflict as a the new generation of. European leaders who are who are really kind of leading the way, and uh, they're, they're not all women. There are there are men in this group as well, but it's interesting that they are predominantly women. And of, and of course, the indomitable uh, Ursula von der Leyen, who is the head of the of the EU, the European Commission, which is that executive branch of the uh, of the EU, has been magnificent as well. And working together with the United States, these leaders plus. Let's say that, you know, the um, maybe less uh, strong or high dominance, I'm not sure what language we want to use, leadership of people like Chancellor uh, Olaf Scholz in, uh, in Germany and, um, and President Macron of, uh, of France, these leaders not really having the steel or that, uh, that some of the, the other leaders I just mentioned do, being much softer wax, much more likely to, in Macron's case, at least just suck up to Putin month after month after month, even after the, even after the invasion. And it's clear that Putin was, was, doesn't want to talk to anybody. This isn't the kind of thing you see in the countries and among the women I just mentioned. But nevertheless, Macron did come around and and, uh, and so did Schultz. And what we have is a Western world, really a broader democratic world, that is largely united by this anti-Putin effort. You know, the reason is, isn't just that everybody hates Putin or everybody has a bad experience with Russia, although most of them have had bad experiences with Russia now, since over the last 10 years, Putin has been engaging in this kind of outrageous in-your-face autocracy promotion campaign that involves, you know, the wild spreading of disinformation um, and hacking into, into computer systems, internets, internet systems in all over Europe for the purpose of you know, demoralizing people and, and undermining democracy in these countries, but also obviously because this invasion poses the greatest, you know, gravest threat to, um, to European security since, since Hitler invaded Poland. Uh, you know, for a, a, for a large country with a big army and a powerful economy to invade a smaller neighboring country because it can and because it wants to annex it, if Russia gets away with this, everything changes in international relations. And European countries realize that their security is on the line. And they've been willing to and eager, in fact, to unite with the United States. All kinds of things ha have happened as a result of the invasion that we couldn't have imagined before. I mean, Sweden and Finland becoming members of NATO, they had been kind of proud neutrals, very much part of Europe, of course, culturally and economically and politically, but nevertheless didn't want to didn't want to ally formally with with uh, with NATO. They have now joined. This is what Putin has wrought, um, and uh, is a is a united a, a united West and indeed a, a fairly united democratic world.
when you think about it, there's something very ironic about the reaction that Putin has elicited from, from the democratic world. Because go back to an earlier point that I said, Putin's one of his big goals is like Russian sovereignty, that Russia be a completely standalone country in the world that can bargain and deal with different countries and different regions, but that really truly calls its own tune and it's dependent on no one, right? Well, what ironically, what Putin has done is destroy what sovereignty Russia had. Russia was, for the most part, part of that sovereign club he talked about. It was never enough for Putin. It's never, never enough to save him before the invasion. But since the invasion, he has so alienated the entire democratic world, and I mean both the West and Japan and South Korea, but in particular the West, that you know he's basically cut off you know that part of the world from you know being having even decent relations with them, and he's had to turn east. And to Russians, there's something kind of especially demoralizing about being dependent on an Asiatic power, right? And to, in order to just get by, he's had to ally as a very much a junior inferior partner with China. And, you know, it's he's had to subordinate Russia's sovereignty to China in a sense, sell it out. Russia's now, you know, becoming and it's going to become a wholly owned subsidiary subsidiary of the People's Republic of China. Uh, Chinese investors, you know, are already getting, uh, you know, big concessions in Siberia. They're moving in, you know, it, at the current rate, China, you know, large chunks of Russia will be will be owned by um, China and China will have a great deal of influence in Russia, you know, coming over the next 10 years or so. Ironic, because that was exactly the opposite of Putin's intention. I don't think any Russian ruler has blown it so badly in this respect, has so alienated one major you know, part of the world, this, in this case to Russia's east, that he or she had to then turn to China or, as the case may be, Europe and really subordinate Russia's uh, sovereignty and lose Russia's sovereignty to them. So what's happened is I mentioned the emergence of a kind of new generation of European leaders. What's more, there's this new consciousness in Europe, as you well know, that we've got to defend ourselves. We have to start taking our own security seriously. And the fact that Trump was president and the fact that Trump wanted to withdraw the United States from NATO, that he was an open enemy of NATO, uh, that he regarded NATO countries as as led by people who didn't respect him, which of course means that then that then he hated them and wanted to get out of NATO. And the fact that he was much, much closer and more comfortable with Putin, with Xi Jinping, in other words, with America's sworn enemies, with Kim Jong-un, with whom he had, by his own account, a, a, brill, a beautiful exchange of love letters throughout his presidency. Now there are boxes and boxes of these things. Not the kind of thing that really inspires European confidence and America's guarantee, uh, commitment to its security. Biden's election, of course, shifted things radically back in favor of you know, Europeans who depend on the American security guarantee. But now with the possibility of Trump being reelected and with Trump so overtly pro-Putin, Trump actually shilled for the invasion of Ukraine, with Trump really being a kind of, you know, controlled asset for Putin, um, European leaders are now, ex ex of course, extremely concerned for their own security, as they should be. And they are now, you know, regarding for the most part, supporting Ukraine is vital to their own security. What will be interesting to see is if the danger of a Trump re-election or the actuality of it, if it happens, combined with Putin's war in Ukraine, will finally encourage European leaders to really pull together in a security union that looks something like like uh, that looks something like the European Union that is separate from the United States, but closely allied with it, in which they really do coordinate closely and begin spending a lot more on their own military and and you know which they they really don't do right now i mean european countries spend much less on their security than the united states does they have lazily depended on the united states for you know ever since world war ii um perhaps not so bad in the early decades after world war ii given europe's rather rather martial and and uh and you know war-torn history but in recent decades that policy has become really anachronistic. And right, right now with Trump's re-election being a possibility, I think a lot of European leaders are realizing they're going to have to actually begin taking more responsibility for their own security. And of course, for the world, 
for the for the democratic world, it would be far superior, far superior to having kind of a one legged, you know, security world where the United States has to deal with secure Europe's security threats and security threats in Asia. If Europe and the United States were both very powerful in economic in security terms as they are in economic terms and cooperated closely as we face the challenges of China and and Russia and the countries that it controls on the other side, that would be a much more secure world. At the same time, we've seen the rise of new leaders in Europe, though, and a kind of you know, recommitment to fundamental democratic principles on the part in defense of them in Ukraine, on the part of uh, many European leaders. We've also seen Putin's, um, Putin's allies in Europe emboldened. And to some extent, they were, they, they were, they were muted and cowed a little bit when Putin's forces started getting their butts kicked early on in the war. But, you know, a lot of European, some European leaders very explicitly lied with Putin. So Viktor Orban in Hungary is, doesn't even criticize the invasion. He, um, he is a, you know, like Donald Trump, he is completely in Putin's pocket. He is allied with Putin. Um, this is true for the leaders of some of the extreme right parties, the Alliance for Germany and Germany, um, the Sweden Democrats, a lot of these other parties in Europe, um, the, in, especially in, in Eastern as well as Western Europe, are, are pro-Putin and they essentially ally with Putin on Ukraine. So Viktor Orban is single-handedly sabotaging all kinds of NATO programs um to you know to aid ukraine because because he is basically acting as a trojan horse for putin within the eu interestingly the eu doesn't have a mechanism for expulsion so we can't get rid of countries like that um you know no one could have ever imagined during the heyday of democracy the kind of heady days of democratization back in 1989 1990 1991 92 that any of these countries in Eastern Europe, still less the poster children for democracy like Hungary and Poland, would go back to not being democracies anymore. They would revert to authoritarianism, ally with the West's enemies. So no mechanism for expulsion from the EU was ever, was ever evolved. Now, of course, we face that, um, but there is no mechanism and, and NATO and the EU and indeed the EU as well are stuck with these with these kind of disloyal, disloyal members, you know, Hungary being probably the most prominent example. Um, so what we see what we see going on in the world now in Europe, it starts in Europe. But then as we go on to the broader world, we see a very interesting and I think in the in, in, in the last century, at least really unique phenomenon emerging. And I don't mean to dramatize this, but I will, because I think it's appropriate. And I think this is actually what's going on, as crazy as, as this might sound. I think what we're seeing is a real showdown between, sorry to use the terms, good and evil in the, in the world. Um, on the one hand, we have the forces of democracy, um, rights, countries and governments who are, you know, bent on people who are bent on governing themselves, uh, on governing themselves in freedom. On the other side, we have the force of autocrats um, whose ideal world in economic terms is a kind of a kind of mercantilist crony capitalist world where the rulers predate on their own populations and predate on the world. And you know what we have is basically the kind of Trump, Putin, Xi Jinping world economy, right? Um, uh, with all with the bad guys for the most part lining up together, regardless of the ideological affiliation or claims of their regime. So you've got China, which was of course a power of the left in the 20th century, now has moved to the far right. Same thing for Russia, aligned with Venezuela, which which claims to be a you know a, a socialist country, a country of the far left. With, the, with Islamic theocracy in, in Iran. There's no kind of underlying ideological um, uh, complexion to this conflict. It's really, it's, it's really a kind of system of values and types of political regime. I call it good versus bad or good versus evil, obviously reflects my own personal values, but I think there's something to it. Um, if you look at the, if you look at the, who supports who in Europe or in the United States, with the Republican Party, 
Now, wanting, you know, under Trump's direction would have been unthinkable under, you know, if this were the party of Reagan or McCain, they would have been out there leading the charge against against Putin's predations. But under Trump, this 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 organization that's become a cult to a single man um, is now abandoning Ukraine um, is now is, you know, because it shares Putin's values and because it uh it does, it, is, it does not share democratic values and because it's in hoc to Trump and Trump is in hoc to Putin, right? And when you get a single man a kind of cult organization of this type, even a party whose history would lead you to think that they would be the leader of the, of the kind of coalition to stand up to him at one of America's greatest sworn enemies um, to defend a, demo- a, a little democracy in, in Ukraine, they are now abandoning uh, they are now abandoning Ukraine. And so the fishers in this kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, light versus dark coalition that's going on in the world are not between countries. This is one reason why I'm not all that crazy about the kind of free world versus unfree world distinction that, that you get in, in, some, in some discourse, because really the, the fishers are not between you know, uh, you know, c- free countries and unfree countries. Now, it so happens that, you know, some countries are unfree by virtue of the fact that they're governed by dictatorships or would be dictators, you know, countries like like Russia or, or Hungary and Orban has dragged Hungary back uh, to a kind of semi autocracy, not nearly as close to polity as Russia is under Putin, but nevertheless, no longer even a full blown democracy. Um, the government just voted out of power in Poland. Um, that was in power, the Law and Justice Party, with its LGBT free zones and other other charming entities like that, um, dragged Poland back away from democracy for eight years. So what we have going on here in Europe and then in the broader world is a kind of lining up of, I'll just say it, good guys versus bad guys, um, but not good countries versus bad countries in any way, right? So, you know, the, the, the fault lines run within countries. Within Russia, it's between people like, like Putin and people like Alexei Navalny or Vladimir Karamurza or other brave, you know, uh, Russian Democrats who are willing to sacrifice the freedom and even their lives for democracy in their, in their homeland. In, you know, in France, it's between liberals like Macron and, and uh, illiberals like Marine Le Pen. Right, um, who leads the rally of the Republic Party, which is which is ethno national and very Trumpian. Um, we see this in Germany with the alliance, the Alternative for Germany Party, lining up with Putin, um, and lining up. Kind of, you know, it's a it's it's got its roots in the Nazi Party. It fools around with Nazi slogans and salutes um, versus, say, the Christian Democratic Party and the Social Democratic Party, the traditional kind of mainstream parties in Germany, which are pro democratic. United States, obviously, and I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody, but I'm just going to say it because it's a fact. We have the Democrats versus the Republicans, um, with the Republicans lining up in the bad guy category. Now, I say this as someone who grew up in a Republican family, um, small business, you know, small business owner, father actually started off as a gas station attendant, worked his way up to buying a little little shop, uh, small government, personal responsibility, all that, all that good old Republican stuff. Uh, this is not that party. In fact, there's nothing conservative at all about the Trumpified Republican Party. Um, not only is it not the, the party of McCain and, and, and Reagan, it's, um, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's even worse than that, as we know. And the, the, the real shock, of course, in American politics of the last decade has not been that this crazy demagogue arose. They arise, they, we've had demagogues like that in American history. Um, and every country does, but that he was able to take a party and a two party system, you know, one of the two major parties with him and get its membership almost to a person to completely uh, to, to sacrifice their own principles and debase themselves in his service. This is unique in American history. We've never seen anything like it. Um, that's the real story. And so the Republicans de facto are now lining up with Viktor Orban, with Vladimir Putin, with Xi Jinping. Um, and not all of them, not all of them to be sure, but Trump controls the party so thoroughly now that even those who know better and whose principles would dictate that they very, very strongly oppose Trump in this kind of, you know, this international battle are um, are failing to stand up to him. So just to give you an example, 
um, a crucial election with democracy on the ballot, very much like it is in November in the United States, occurred in Brazil at the, at the end of uh, 2022. Um, it it, it, uh, it uh, featured the incumbent, who was Jair Bolsonaro, who calls himself the Trump of the tropics and in every way tried to imitate Trump in power, versus uh, uh, Lula, as, as he's fondly called, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, um, who was the former president who was coming back to challenge Bolsonaro. You had a very clear democracy versus, versus authoritarianism uh, call here. Lula's on the far left, but he is a committed small d Democrat. Uh, Bolsonaro, just completely in the Trump mold, threatened not to leave office if he didn't get elected. And then in the, in the event, when he was defeated, his supporters staged a copycat crime like January 6th. They did it on January 8th in the Brazilian capital and trashed the Supreme Court, congressional and, and, and presidential palace, um, much more even than the rioters did in January 6th here. So within Brazil, you've got this distinction, right, with Lula and his people, and then the Bolsonaristas, who are basically MAGA people, um, and identify as, as MAGA people, they use that term for themselves sometimes, um, lined up on the other side. And what we see emerging in the international system are informal alliances of these different, of these different factions, right? So Bolsonaro and Trump, Viktor Orban and Hungary, Putin, these people are they're friends with each other. They relate to each other. They visit each other. They support each other when they're elected. They offer each other moral and financial support. And on the other side, you have Alexei Navalny and Joe Biden and, and you know Barack Obama and most of the Democratic Party in the United States, politicians like Lula, um, European Democrats of all sorts, Japanese Democrats, Democrats in developing countries as well. Now, there's a bit of a wrinkle here. Um, in this, uh, let me say first of all, we've never, we haven't seen in contemporary times such a kind of light, you know, kind of good guys versus bad guys distinction in international relations. You know, if you think back, and what we're facing now is the danger of all the power being with the bad guys, for lack of a better term. Again, think about it. If Trump is reelected, if Trump is reelected. Um, The government of Russia, the government of the United States, and you add lesser powers like Saudi Arabia and Iran and North Korea, all on the same side. If you just and and the and India to some extent with its ethno-national, not so good for democracy Prime Minister Narendra Modi, you're going to have the biggest and most important economic and political powers in the world and military powers in the world all lined up on the, and I think from the standpoint of, of my values, on the wrong side. In World War II, if you look at that, the United States and Great Britain, for all our awful perfidies and colonial history, nevertheless, were, were forces of, of democracy fighting back against forces of fascism. We allied with, with Stalin's uh, Stalin's Soviet Union, so it wasn't a good guys versus bad guys thing purely um, by any means, but still, you know, the forces of democracy and liberalism were were stronger, right? They were ultimately than the than the than the fascist powers, Germany, Japan, and its allies. Um, now, if Trump is reelected, we are going to have the the most dire possible global situation. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe I'll return to that in the, in the Q and A because I think this is uh, this is a matter of the utmost importance. Let me say also that um, there are wrinkles in this model. Uh, we have democracies in the world who are less than enthusiastic for really going all in on supporting Ukraine against Putin. Uh, the government of South Africa, which is a full-blown, vibrant democracy. Uh, Lula himself in Brazil, very much a Democrat at home, but one who cozies up to dictators just as a matter of habit abroad, including Nick, including the Nicolas Maduro, who's one of the, truly one of the world's worst dictators in Venezuela, Putin, Xi, whatever ideological orientation, that's rooted in his anti-Americanism. He's a grizzled old lefty trade unionist who um, remembers the days of the 60s and 70s when, you know, the left in Latin America thought of the United States, perhaps with some justification, as being kind of a, a hegemonic imperial power in their region. Um, and so he likes to play this balancing act, and that time that oftentimes means allying with or at least 
not align with the United States, even in, in battles like what we face in Ukraine. South African government is run by a bunch of old revolutionaries, uh, anti-apartheid revolutionaries who remembered uh, Ronald Reagan's ambivalent attitude toward the apartheid regime. It's kind of element of kind of third worldism, as we used to call it back in the, you know, back before the 1990s and uh, anti-Americanism involved in that. Um, for the most part, though, we do have this remarkable kind of distinction in the world between countries who are democracies and who's and, you know, that are controlled by people who, who advocate liberal values and countries that are actually, you know, controlled by governments who who advocate illiberal values. It's really kind of a liberal versus illiberal distinction. And by liberal, I don't mean just progressive. I mean, I mean, also kind of classical liberals. Um, and you see this in UN votes. It's really interesting. You can actually you can look at UN votes on the Ukraine war, and you see just all and sundry dictatorships, and you know you know left, right, whatever, crazy military dictatorships, single party dictatorships, all lining up, you know, with you know abstaining or voting with Putin, and uh, and all the all the democracies, save a handful that I just mentioned, um, on the other side. Um, I will. I, I see that I don't have a lot of more, a lot more time left. Let me just let me just end with a few remarks about the United States and and uh, what our current what our election means um, for what's coming up in the world. You should already know, and I've already touched on what I think is at stake in this election. The answer is everything. The election in November. Um, I'm not a specialist in American politics, but. Uh, after Donald Trump was elected and I saw that my fellow political scientists were not churning out the, the books and articles on what we could do to stop him, and due, due in part, I think, to the fact that Americanists, people who study American politics, are not used to dealing with you know, regime questions like you know, whether democracy is going to survive, uh, which I was, as a, which I am as a comparativist who studied the region of the world we're talking about today and, and other, other kind of regions where there's been a showdown between authoritarianism and democracy. That I, you know, I have a book coming out in April that Donald kindly mentioned, um, called "The Comeback: uh, Crushing Trump, Claiming the Nation, and Restoring Democracy's Edge." And it's basically about the stakes and how the Democrats can uh, can put down this challenge. Um, again, I never would have thought that democracy would be on the line in the United States. Internationally, the entire the entire autocratic world is waiting for a Trump comeback. If Putin thinks if he can outweigh the West and Trump is reelected, that he can he gets to keep the, the territories that he now occupies. That's essentially five Ukrainian provinces. Um, that the whole endeavor and the cost to him will be absolutely worth it if he's able to keep those territories. And if Trump is reelected, there's a very big danger that he will. The, United, the, the Western alliance simply cannot do without American leadership and certainly not with American uh, war material. Trump has made it absolutely clear that he sides with Putin, that he would cut off aid to Ukraine if he could. He clearly, and, and I would say absolutely remarkably, has been able to bring along Mike Johnson and all these, you know, the Republicans in Congress with him on that, who've already, as we know, um, essentially, you know, turned off the spigot and aid to Ukraine. Um, with, with horrific, horrific consequences, in my view, for American interests, the interests of, of democracy in the world and a, and a rule governed order. And I don't just mean an American rule governed order. I mean, a, an order that isn't just an order of might makes right that returns us to a kind of pre World War Two scenario. Um, Xi Jinping and certain is certainly hoping for a Trump comeback as well. He won't say it because uh, but nevertheless, you know, Trump does such a magnificent job of discrediting democracy. And she, like Putin now, regards democracies as kind of existential threats to their regimes by virtue of the demonstration effect that they that they pose. This is part of why she is so got such a bee in his bonnet about Taiwan um, that, you know, I can't tell you how much rides on. And many of you, of course, know this on our election in November. I'm always surprised, despite my, you know, over three decades now as a political scientist, it just how much influence the United States has in this world. And it doesn't have to be military. It doesn't have to be economic. It's just we are the most watched and imitated country in the world. Um, and when the Democrats, you know, tragically, I would say we need to put that, lose a, use a large D for that these days, because the Republicans are no longer small D Democrats. That wasn't the case until Trump, of course. Um, when the Democrats do well in the United States, they seem to be ascendant, they're in charge. This, this empowers Democrats, you know, small d Democrats, the world over. Um, when you have, when you had Trump in power, 
um, democracy's enemies the globe over felt em emboldened. And you had you know, massive waves of human rights abuses and, and dictatorships because countries' leaders knew that they would no longer face the carping you know, interference of, a, of, a, of obnoxious American you know, people telling them that they can't do that or threatening to, to uh, you know, out them in international fora and so on. Uh, if Trump is reelected, everything um, that uh, that I think people of goodwill in general is going to be on the line, and that's globally as well as in the United States. Again, that demonstration effect of what happens here really makes an enormous enormous difference in the world, from from Brasilia to Moscow to to um, to Paris.